And we are going to read from the Gospel lesson, Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. Surprisingly, as I look back, I realize I have never, ever, ever, ever in my 25 years of ministry preached on this lesson. How crazy is that? But yet this is such a wonderful and beautiful story, and I hope I can share just a little bit of how passionate a story it is. And so we read from the Gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter. After Jesus had finished all of his sayings, in the hearing of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a centurion there had a slave whom he had valued highly, who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish leaders, uh, Jewish elders to him, asking him to come to him and heal his servant. Now when they came to Jesus, they appealed to him and earnestly said, He is worthy of having this done for him, for he loves our people. It is he who built our synagogue for us. Jesus went with them, but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent a friend to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume you to come to me, or I did not pres presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and to my slave... Uh, I say, do this, and he, he, the slave does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turned to the crowd that followed him and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found that the slave was in good health. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Bless our lesson today. Bless our time. Bless my words and the meditation of all present hearts, O God. For he asks us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Everybody, uh, everybody likes to be the boss, isn't that right? We love to be the boss as long as we can tell everybody where to go and how to get off. And I always tell people, I've got plenty of people in life telling me where to go so I never get lost. That is the truth, I hate to say. But we like to be the boss until it comes time to take responsibility for the mess that is made. And then we don't like being the boss anymore. Can you imagine God created the universe and all that exists? And when it came time for the mess that needed to be cleaned up in this world that we created, his precious children, what did God do? God got his hands dirty, changed the dirty diapers, in fact it's worse than that, stuck his hands in the stink of this planet, in the stink that we created, and cleaned up our mess because that's what a good, good father does, right? That's what a great and good leader does is cleans up the mess that is left by those who follow him. You know, I was reminded, uh, again, my, my wife, as you know, works for McDonald's, and, and I'm told this to be true. I guess it's true that Ray Kroc, whenever he would walk into a restaurant, you remember, this guy This guy's a, was a multi-billionaire by this point, I'm sure, had many, many stores and was uh, this, this multinational company who was running. He'd walk into a store and there was a mess on the floor or something, a mess in the bathroom. He didn't go screaming and yelling at all the managers and the bosses, get this cleaned up. He apparently would go and take a mop and clean up the mess himself and clean up the bathrooms himself because that's what a good leader does. They lead by example. And so in our lesson for today, we're here to talk about a guy, a centurion, who is basically the equivalent of a colonel in the U.S. Army. So he, and underneath his care, has an entire regiment, thousands, five, ten thousand 10,000 people under his command. At any moment, he can tell them, do this and do that. Now, one of the things you have to understand, in that day, in that age in particular, it was not some type of political uh, appointment or honorary or ceremonial post to be appointed as a centurion. You had to earn this. So this man was a tough guy who through many battles had earned his position as a centurion and had earned and won the respect of his peers and the soldiers underneath of him. So this was an amazing guy already. And here he was in charge as a centurion of thousands of men. And he was also given charge of this city of Capernaum to keep it safe, to also rule it on behalf of the Roman government to make sure taxes were raised and to make sure that, again, there were no uprisings. And so one of the things that happened is that they would surround themselves with servants. Sometimes they would be Jewish servants, sometimes servants from around the world. And servants and slaves in those days were considered living tools. And they were worthy uh, only uh, as long as they were able to, to do the jobs that they were called to do. 
They were welcome to live in the house of the master, but once they were no longer able to do the, the job that they were able to do, they were just cast off. They're just like an old garbage bag or an old rag that you would just pitch into the garbage and you never thought about it. But for him, this man was unusual because he cared for the servant. That's unusual. As I said, slaves were often cast out when they became worthless, but this man desperately loved this servant. How unique this is. That's not all that's unique about this, uh, this, uh, this man. One of the other unusual things that he did, not just that he built a synagogue, the Bible says, but he actually respected and cared for the Jewish people underneath of him. Now, it was typical, oftentimes, that a Roman leader or centurion would build a synagogue for the Jewish people because it was considered the opiate for the masses, keep them pacified, build them a synagogue, and so it was a very cynical thing oftentimes, but this guy seemed to be very severe, or sincere in his faith. He actually believed in the God of the Jews and respected and honored the God of the Jews. So he built this not just to pacify the Jews because there was something important to him about the, the Jewish faith. He genuinely, genuinely loved this God. And then you go over to the back of the front page, the back page, I guess. The back of the front page is the back page, right? Just check it. The other thing we learn about the centurion is his absolute humility. He knew that the Jewish religious leaders would not be permitted into his home. He knew that Jesus couldn't come into his home. When he heard that Jesus was coming, remember it was his servants or his, his friends, his Jewish friends that went out and appealed to Jesus. Jesus, go and heal this man's servant because he loves him so dearly. When he heard that Jesus was coming, he sent one of his friends out and said, please tell Jesus not to come here. My house is a mess. Okay, that's not exactly what he said. But can you imagine, it's kind of like that. My household is a mess because I'm a pagan. I'm not a Jew. I'm not worthy that this master should come into my house. But he just speaks a word from a distance. I don't even have to hear the word. All I have to do is trust that this Jesus, this master speaks the word, and I believe my servant's going to be healed. What faith does this man have and what humility that he would not even allow Jesus to come at his home because he just did not think he was worthy of it. So people can be wise. He was a wise man. The friends of the centurion, again, as I told you, told Jesus that he would submit to whatever simple command that Jesus had of him because he believed that words had power and authority. Jesus only had to speak the word. And Jesus turns to the crowd that followed and said, You know, I have never seen, he said to them, such faith, not out of my disciples, not out of any religious leader, not out of any Jews in the nation of Israel, but this centurion, pagan man, <coughs> has more faith than I've seen on this planet. How astonishing that is. It's amazing. Here's Jesus, who's, who's God. You'd think he wouldn't be astonished by these things. But I think that just shows you how wonderfully astonished he is. What a spectacular <coughs> breath of fresh air. Think of it that way. It's not so much an indictment of the Jews. He's seen plenty of faith amongst the Jews. But it is basically a statement of, I am just so amazed. Look at this. How spectacular this man's faith is. What humility. I was thinking of humility a lot this week. Because sometimes... I don't necessarily have a lot of it, okay? Uh, I like to be in charge. I like to be the boss. I like to have things under control. I like things done my way. But this man is truly a challenge to me, and we are called to be humble. Now, I was thinking that, why? Because for the last three days, I've been in Shippensburg, at Shippensburg University. We've had the PIAA Track and Field Championships. Most of you know I'm a track and field coach. And so we, we uh, qualified several of our athletes from our school, and they were running in the track and field championships. And I saw many examples of humility, and I saw many negative examples of a lack of humility. I'm embarrassed to say that one of the displays of lack of humility was from one of my athletes. And I don't appreciate that, because I take that personally, because I feel like, what did I do to fail this boy that he doesn't understand that especially champions have to approach life 
with a great deal of humility. Why? Because today's champion is going to be dethroned tomorrow. There's always somebody else coming along that's bigger, better than you, that's going to sit you on your rear end. And you better be just as approachable and humble when you're successful because you're not going to be successful someday in some occasion. So I'm going to tell you what happened. I mean, a couple of stories, like three stories real quick. One, I, you know, we had uh, one of the relays. It was a four-by-one relay. It wasn't our team. But this one team expected to win because they had won the last couple of years in the four-by-one relay. And they're running, running. All of a sudden, the last guy got the baton. He was way in front. But this guy, this guy behind him ran him down and beat him right at the finish line by this much. The guy took his baton, the guy who lost, took his baton and threw it at the feet of the other guy. He was so ticked off that he lost. Now, I don't know if you know what happens when you do that. That's called poor sportsmanship. Your team is eliminated. So his team that took second place now took no place. They were eliminated. They're DQ because of that poor sportsmanship, that lack of humility. Last year they won. This year, because they didn't win, they get all ticked off about it. I told you one of my athletes did a very similar thing. He won last year. He was the best uh, athlete in the state of Pennsylvania. This year, he took second place. Guess what he did with his, his medal as soon as he got it? He, started, he, went, he, he threw it in the garbage. He took second place in the state of Pennsylvania. He wanted to throw it in the garbage. His mom said, don't do that. He started walking away from his mom. I just yelled at him. I said, you will stop and listen to your mother right now. He stopped. I mean, he wouldn't listen to his mom. As soon as I said that, he stopped like this. He went, he turned around. She said, you get a picture with your coach right now, and you will smile. He said, I'm not going to smile. I said, you will listen to your mother, and you will smile. And you will put that metal back on your, over top of you, and you will be gracious about this. That's what he said. I was just astonished at his lack of humility. He was upset that he didn't win. I get it. I know what it's like to lose. But we need to approach life with a great deal of humility. So I'm going to finish with a good story of humility that I saw there. There was a girl, a young girl, she was a freshman, and she just crushed the senior who was expecting to win because she would won the last few years. The senior just crumpled down on her knees. She started falling. I mean, it's sad, you know? It's sad. Because I know what it feels like. This freshman girl turned around, but she was all excited. She was just happy, and she was jumping up and down. She turned around. She saw the senior. She stopped. She turned around. She knelt down. And she gave her a big hug. It was the coolest thing. This girl had just won the championship, and she was more concerned about this girl who was hurt. That's, that's so cool, because that's humility, you see. And that's what this centurion had, that sense of humility. There's always somebody else to consider. There's always somebody else that's important. It's not about me winning. It's about us. I won. That's great. Oh, how are you doing? I'm the centurion. That's great. But what about my servant? Because I love him. See, that's what a good leader does. He acknowledges that he may be a leader in a certain realm, but there's always somebody bigger and more impressive and somebody to whom we need to bow and kneel. And in this case, he recognized and acknowledged it was Jesus Christ. So what did he learn from this lesson? This healing Jesus about this story. If you look at the bottom of our page, I think these are some of the things I learned. First of all, that Jesus is for everyone. And that faith may often be found in most unexpected places in a pagan Roman centurion is the most pure, prototypical faith in all the world. Three, that a simple word of God is sufficient. All God has to do is speak a word, and we can be healed. You know, that's what's so impressive. God has given us a written word. All we have to do is open this word, and trust me, this word will heal you in a powerful way if you just open up and listen and then lastly, and also with that, it is not our faith that brings the healing, but it is the gift of God because God just loves us because he's what? A good, good father. And he just loves me very much.
And he loves us enough to crash into our world, to come to us in our time of need, to care for us. But the one thing that keeps us and prevents us from sometimes receiving the blessing of God, it's not that blessing of God isn't there. See, I think we have this wrong understanding how God blesses us. God just keeps pouring his blessing on us, and sometimes we open up our hands and receive it. There are other times we close ourselves off. It is that lack of humility when we just think that we got to do it all by ourselves, that I'm the boss, that I'm the one in charge. That's basically keeping my hands up like this to God saying, I'm not going to receive your blessing. God still pours it on us. God keeps dumping his blessing on us day after day after day. But you know what it feels like? It's a dumping. Because we we got our hands up like this. But when we open up our hands in humility like this, God's blessing will truly fill us to overflowing. I'm just going to ask us to bow our heads in prayer today. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come just with a very harsh mentality of we want to be boss, we want to be the boss of our lives, we want to be in charge of everything. But we see in the example today of this centurion, that humility, yeah. that he was able to open up his hands for your blessing. And the blessings that you shower upon everybody, it's not like you just give it to certain people. There's what, 7 billion people on this planet? You are pouring out your blessing on 7 billion people today. Some of us are willing to receive it. Even some of us who call upon <coughs> you as, as Christians are not. We put our hands up to you. We close our hearts to you. We don't humble ourselves. And because of that, we fail to receive our blessing. So I'm asking you, would help us to humble ourselves, to bow our knee to you, to open up our hands in submission and say, God, please just fill me. Because you are a good God, God, who wants to bring your healing into our lives. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name.